you can start when you want. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Um, and thanks again to the organizers and the participants for coming. Uh, so, I, I'm basically going to assume that everyone was here yesterday when we talked about, roughly speaking, the conservative dynamics of a binary system in the near zone. Uh, actually, let me start here. Um, so my goal in these lectures, again, is to try to give you a sense of how in the traditional post-Newtonian approach, which is the approach that has actually made it all the way to be used in LIGO data analysis alongside numerical relativity. Also, these post-Newtonian results, as, as Alessandro told us about, are incorporated into, um, for example, this effective one-body EOB formalism, um, which attempts to use important information from, from the test particle limit in a Schwarzschild background, in the non-spinning case, to resum the dynamics in a certain way. But EOB, one anchor point for EOB is that it has to match when you re-expand in the post-Newtonian expansion, you want it to match exactly what I'm telling you about, which is these straightforward post-Newtonian results. And so I'm trying to give you a sense of how one goes from beginning to end uh, to a model for a waveform from gravitational waves from a binary. And we start at one end uh, with the binary itself. And in the post-Newtonian approximation, you know, we make things look like Newtonian physics. So our binary is going to be described by, and you know, I'm leaving spin completely out of this story and higher multiple moments, but we have two masses, M1 and M2. We're gonna describe their positions in three-dimensional space with displacement vectors from an origin. So Z1 is the, three vector displacement from the origin for the first body and then Z2 for the other body. That's how we describe the binary. And the next step is to solve the post-Newtonian field equations, given some motion of these world line sources. So we talked about this in detail yesterday and about how to get equations of motion for these world lines together with solutions to the field equations. An important point was these field equations, they look like Newtonian field equations in that they start like the Laplacian, the flat space Laplacian acting on some potential equals some source. So this involves this instantaneous action at a distance um, type of interactions. Which is why this, I mean, and also that's what comes out of expanding Einstein's equations in this context, you know, formally expanding in one over the speed of light. But that's also why these post Newtonian field equations are fundamentally limited to the near zone, in that, as I mentioned yesterday, this instantaneous action at distance description has to break down when we get on the order of a gravitational wavelength, gravitational wave wavelength away from the binary. And let me fix this thing that I botched yesterday. So thinking about our binary, you know, the typical velocity, say, say our binary is on an exactly circular orbit. Then we know that the velocity which with, with which both guys are moving are related to the orbital frequency in that simple way, V is R omega. And then the frequency of the gravitational waves, okay, it, the gravitational wave frequency is twice this, but dropping all the twos. So this gravitational wavelength is the speed of light over this orbital frequency. Now using this relation, that is C over V times the and I should say R 
little r here is this orbital separation. Okay, so what we learn here is that the gravitational, the, the wavelength will be much larger than the size of the system if this is large. So that's why the post-Newtonian assumption, which is that this is small, if that is true, then this will be much bigger than this, which tells us that we have a lot of space before we get out to a gravitational wavelength where our, our approach with instantaneous action at distance will become invalid. That's what I wanted to say in this picture yesterday. Okay, so then we have this near zone where we, we solve the field equations, get equations of motion, all in terms of post-Newtonian fields. That becomes inaccurate when you get too far away and we have to match to a post-Minkowskian description with actual wave-like field equations in the far zone. And that's what we want to talk about today. So, yeah, let me just skip to that first. A two-slide two summary of last time. So <clears throat> we want to solve for the gravitational field. The gravitational field is the space-time metric. We parameterized it in a certain way in terms of at first post-Newtonian order. Actually, the only relevant degrees of freedom are the, a scalar potential and a vector potential, which enter the metric in this way. Yesterday, I didn't write this exponentials, but it's the same. And they obey these field equations, which again, they look like, like the, the left-hand side is a Laplace operator acting on the potentials. So instantaneous action and distance here. If we go to first post-Newtonian order, like picking up the one over C squared corrections, we need to include this retardation effect, but it's here treated as a perturbation. And then there's some sources. And sorry. Police driving by outside. Um, we talked about this, how to use point particles with world lines as delta function sources to plug in here and essentially quite easily get solutions to these field equations sourced by these point particle sources. And you know, here you recognize um, the basic Newtonian potential created by a body with mass M1 and world line Z1 of tau. Then there are these one over C squared corrections. Um, and this term comes from this retardation effect, another one over C squared correction. Plus one goes to two. That's a complete solution for this potential. And then for the, the vector potential, which we only need to work to really zeroth order and one over C squared. It's basic, it's just like the Newtonian, the scalar potential, except instead of the mass, it's the momentum. So it's like a Coulomb field of the momentum is this vector potential. And so these are complete solutions to these first post Newtonian field equations, which give us this complete space-time metric. And this is solving Einstein's equations plus order one over C to the fourth. We also talked about how having these solutions to the field equations, these imply equations of motion for our world lines, which are encoded, for example, in a Lagrangian that we, we talked about how to obtain this as the Fokker Lagrangian um, from the total action. But yeah, long story short, we have world lines, we have their equations of motion, and we have the complete gravitational field given 
in terms of these world lines and the masses. So that's basically our complete description of this near zone post Newtonian physics. And so, you know, of course, one can go to higher orders, uh, second post Newtonian, third post Newtonian, etc. The story won't change much. So it becomes very dependent on how you want to write things. But uh, in all ways that I know of, you get an extra degree of freedom. So in the space, space part of the metric, there will be an extra tensor potential coming in at second post Newtonian order, but et cetera. And the, the field equations get actually nonlinear. We, we had a kind of miracle here that at first post Newtonian order, the field equations were still linear, even though we have a leading nonlinearity coming from expanding this exponential to second order. But in spite of, um, it coming becoming more complicated. The basic story is the same. To go to higher orders in post-Newtonian, you write down the field equations, you source them with point particle world lines, you solve field equations, plug that back into the total action roughly to get this Fokker action and get equations of motion. Again, the end of the story is going to be you have complete solutions for the complete metric in this post-Newtonian near zone given as functionals of world lines and depending otherwise only on masses. Of course, I'm glossing over a lot of important things. And then at the end of last time, I had to, uh, we were talking about, okay, so let me go back to this picture. So we were describing, you know, just now these world lines, they give us the field or the metric. But once we get, let's say, outside the system, not very, not all the way to the far zone, but let's just say anywhere outside the system. So we're dealing with matter. Um, I'm sorry, we're dealing with vacuum at that point. The matter is all interior and we're not going to care about that. But let's say in this region, in this next step, which is going to be matching to the post Minkowskian field in the far zone, the best way, at least in the post Newtonian expansion to, to do this matching and to convey the information to the outside is to think about the multipole moments of the entire, of the binary system considered as a whole. So that's what we were talking about at the end of last time and no, not there. Well, yeah, last time I slowed, showed this very complicated, formidable looking thing. Um, I'm showing that again here today, but I kind of cleaned it up a bit. Where, so how are these multiple moments defined? And one simplest way to think about it is think about the most general solution to the vacuum field equations outside any system has to take a certain form in terms of that system's multiple moments. That's what we were writing down here. Um, and these multiple moments are, so there's a set of, for every different value of little l, there's a tensor um, with, little l indices, which using a common notation in this literature of this multi-index, big L, um, these are the set of first mass multiple moments which characterize the system. And here in this expansion for the scalar potential, these mass multiple moments are the terms that go like, actually, let me come down here. This is the best way to explain it. Uh, they're the terms that, so the first one looks, should look very familiar. This is the mass monopole over the distance from the origin. The mass dipole is with one derivative of one over R, essentially. The mass quadrupole, two indices, 
with two derivatives of one over R. And we mentioned last time how this is actually, again, the most general solution to this Laplace equation parameterized in terms of some so far undetermined functions of time. The multiple moments only depend on time. The spatial dependence all comes through these derivatives of one over R. You can also see why this solves Laplace equation basically because one over R is a vacuum solution or is a solution to the Laplace equation away from R equals zero, but we're not at R equals zero. We're somewhere outside the system. The Laplacian commutes with all these derivatives. That's why this solves the field equation. And you can also see how this is a equivalent to a decomposition in terms of spherical harmonics. This is L equals zero, L equals one, L equals two, little l. Also, in the general solution, there would be terms that go like increasing powers of the distance. So these are going to blow up. These would blow up at infinity if we went, went there. These are the so-called tidal moments. In this case, the gravito electric ones. And then it's a bit, bit more comp. So, well, this is not any more complicated than the first line in that for the vector potential, I just have three copies of this. I just add this index and then I add an index here and here. That in the same way is the most general solution to the Laplace equation for a vector, for a three vector. But importantly, how these things are decomposed in a certain way, which depends on their, uh, they're basically decomposed into irreducible parts under the 3D rotation group. So, this, we have one index and then on these L indices, so I also should have mentioned, all of these guys are fully symmetric and trace free on all of their indices. And a bit of explain why? Well, notice this object is symmetric and trace free because a trait, well, it's obviously symmetric since this is just a bunch of derivatives. It's trace-free because the trace would be a Laplacian and the Laplacian of one over R is zero. So that's why this is trace-free. That's why if this weren't trace-free, the trace parts would be projected out here. You can also verify that this is only going to solve Laplace's equation if these guys are trace-free totally symmetric and totally trace free on all their indices. Okay, and now these guys are not totally symmetric trace free, but we decompose them into, okay, a part which is anti-symmetric under interchange of this extra index with one of the L indices, a part which is totally symmetric and trace free, which turns out to be According to the field equations and the gauge condition in particular, these, this contribution in the vector potential is determined by these mass multiple moments. And then here from this anti-symmetric part, these are these new current multiple moments. Again, it's, like, it's just like the mass multiple moments, except mass density basically has been replaced by momentum density. And yesterday I was writing a third possible part here, which would be in it. So besides anti-symmetric, fully STF, there could also be a trace part. Today I've left it out. Um, just saying modulo a gauge transformation, but that here, this trace part would be pure gauge. There's a similar situation for these title moments. Okay, and now down here. So as we said, this is the monopole, mass monopole, monopole, dipole, quadrupole. And quickly, so this first tidal moment is completely irrelevant. It's like a, we could just say it's a time rescaling. Uh, however you spell rescaling. scaling. 
because it's basically a contribution to this scalar potential, which doesn't depend on space. So um, it is essentially rescaling time up here in the metric. The second one would correspond to a uniform, uniform acceleration, right? It looks like a contribution to the potential, which is linear in X. That would be the, the fictitious gravitational field due to uniform acceleration. So that one doesn't, isn't really physical either. The first tidal moment, the quadrupolar tidal moment, this E, would be a physical influence of the external universe from something in the external universe causing a non-uniform gravitational field. So we don't want to think about our binary being embedded in an external universe where something is happening. We want to idealize and say, there is nothing outside our binary except asymptotically flat space-time. But why I'm including these terms here is because in a certain sense, when we match this post-Newtonian description onto some post minkowskian description in the far zone, radiation reaction effects will, in a certain way of looking at it, come back into the near zone in the form of something that looks like a tidal influence from the external universe. So that's kind of why we're including these in this matching procedure that's coming. Okay, so I hope I've given you a sense of what these multiple moments are. Um, and so room so these are expressions for these potentials in the near zone in a post newtonian uh near zone we already had expressions due to our point particles for those same metric potentials and more or less it's just a matter of taking these expressions and re-expanding them about x the sum about x equals zero instead of about the world lines of the bodies here. So again, it's important that this is a multiple expansion about the point x equals zero, some so far arbitrary origin of our coordinate system. But essentially, you can massage this into this, and that determines what these multiple moments are. So again, now for the moment, we're not going to get any contribution to these from what I'm saying now, to these tidal moments. Okay, you can also come up with directly, direct expressions for these multiple moments in terms of integrals over the stress energy tensor, but here I'm just showing you the results. So the mass monopole at first post-Newtonian order, it's not just the sum of the two masses, there's also an energy-like contribution. And in fact, this first post-Newtonian mass multipole, mass monopole is exactly the Newtonian total energy divided by C squared. There's a kinetic energy for body one, and then half of the total gravitational pot potential energy. You add one goes to two and you get the total Newtonian. There's a mass dipole, which you can see is exactly the same as the top line, except we add the position of the body to both terms. And so I haven't completely justified this, but there are, so this, yeah, long story short, setting the mass dipole to zero would take you to the center of mass frame just like in Newtonian gravity, um, where we would say, we want to set the origin of our coordinates to the center of mass of the system. That would just be this plus one goes to two equals zero. And then we could solve for each of the two world lines in terms of only their difference. So you can do the same thing and first post-Newtonian order, it's just, you have to set this equal to zero. 
that takes you to the center of mass frame and you can work then with this separation between the two bodies instead of the individual world lines. And finally, most importantly, you keep going, you get an expression for the mass quadrupole moment at first post Newtonian. So at Newtonian order, it would just be this term, but you get all these one over C squared corrections um, from the one over C squared corrections in the metric as we talked about much yesterday. So the important point I want to get over here is there are some multiple moments. They characterize the binary as a whole. They're given ultimately as functionals only of the world lines. And otherwise here, depending only on the masses. Everything here is just depending on the world lines. Um, and it turns out if we wanted to work finally going all the way to the waveform, if we wanted to work to first post-Newtonian order, this mass quadrupole moment we need with its one over C squared corrections, we will also need the mass octopole moment, but only at Newtonian order. And the current quadrupole moment, but again, only um, at the leading order in one over C squared. And so also the current dipole, which is exactly the spin of the binary when you add one goes to two, it actually doesn't enter the gravitational waveform because there are conservation laws associated with these three special moments. The mass monopole must satisfy a conservation law. I haven't justified exactly why this is true, but <clears throat> I hope it makes sense to you that the mass monopole would be conserved the mass dipole also is conserved. In fact, let's just say the fact that these things are conserved, you can verify from the equations of motion which follow from this Lagrangian. Let me leave it at that for now. You can verify that these two guys are conserved as is this guy, total angular momentum, but none of the other multipole moments starting with the quadrupoles the current quadrupole, sorry, the mass quadrupole and the current quadrupole, and then so on, like the mass octopole, none of those satisfy conservation laws. They're dynamical. And they are what the gravitational waveform will depend on. In fact, more or less, they are going to directly give the gravitational waveform. Um, this mass quadrupole with its one over C squared corrections and these two guys, without one over C squared corrections are essentially going to give directly the waveform. Okay, are there any questions at this point? Hi. Yes. Uh, so I didn't quite get why uh, for the octopole moment, uh, we just need new Newtonian order. Why not one PM? Yeah, so <clears throat> that's that's gonna come up uh, shortly. That's an excellent question. Okay, thanks. Um, and it, it brings a good point that wh why are we even, okay. In the post-Newtonian expansion, higher multipoles end up let me say, yeah, end up at higher PN orders. So I'm just stating this now. It's a very important point. Um, in fact, let, let's, let's move on and see why that's true. Unless there are any more questions on the above. End up. Yeah, I had one more question. Um, yes. So for example, uh, when we look in electrodynamics and we, we talk about this multiple moments, then we have intuition that uh, there is a positive charge, there is a negative charge, and the distribution of charge is different. And that's how we can interpret that, okay, there is a multiple moments. So here, how we get some intuition that, uh, uh, that okay, there is a, mo uh, you know, just a moment, zero order moment or one order moment or two order moments. Mm -hmm. 
so for example, let, let's take the dipole one. Yeah. So, I mean, in the electromagnetism, there is a positive charge other than there is a negative charge. But here, how should we understand this? Uh, so, yeah. So like at Newtonian order, this mass dipole is M1, Z1 plus M2, Z2. Let me say that's a vector. Um, right, and both of the masses are positive, right? So, but what this is, uh, you know, it it's, looks exactly like the, the same analogous formula for the electric dipole. If you just replace the masses, replace the masses by charges. But here, let's, you can say this is by definition of the center of mass in Newtonian physics, this is the total mass times the distance, the, the displacement of the center of mass from the origin, right? The position of the center of mass is this weighted sum of the positions divided by the total mass. Okay. So that is exactly the interpretation of this mass dipole. It's, it's the center of mass position times the total mass in Newtonian physics. This is a relativistic generalization with relativistic corrections. Essentially, in fact, you can see here, it's just it's not just weighted by the rest mass, there are energy, uh, kinetic energy and potential energy contributions okay. to the effective gravitational mass. Okay. Yeah, good question. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, so then we go on to matching to, let me bring this in slowly, uh, matching to the far zone. And so we mentioned, maybe revisit the picture one last time. Uh, in the far zone, we cannot have this instantaneous action at a distance description of the gravitational field. It has to break down once we get more than a wavelength away. We have to switch to actual wave-like equations. And so we start with the linearized field equations. And those are here. Um, so should be very familiar. Now we're writing the the full metric as Minkowski plus a perturbation. Let's work with the trace reversed metric perturbation. Again, in harmonic gauge. And we get our simple field equation box H equals zero. Okay, so this is just the free wave equation for our tensor field. H bar in flat space time. And now let's consider what is the most general solution to this equation in a vacuum region outside the source with a no incoming radiation condition. And it's surprisingly simple. So this is theorem one from Blanchet's living review in relativity. And okay, so it is characterized this completely general solution with no incoming radiation and here, which goes to zero at infinity. So here there are no analogs of tidal moments, but actually surprisingly, it is again characterized by only two infinite sets of multiple moments. So mass, multiples, this time I'm calling them I, L, and current. multiples, this time calling them J. But again, this is some, these are a set of things with lots of indices going up to A little l. And in fact, you know, this looks exactly like what we saw before for, sorry, I'm switching back and forth. 
for you here, the only difference, well, two important differences. One is that these multiple moments, they're not just, they're functions of a single variable, but that variable is not just T, it is this retarded time, T minus the distance from the origin over C. So all of these multiple moments here are functions of this retarded time. The other difference, well, actually that's kind of the only difference here, but so again, these are spatial derivatives, lots of L different spatial derivatives acting on and contracted with these multiple moments on one over R, but notice in general, these spatial derivatives will not only hit this one over R, they will also hit this retarded time here. Okay, other than that, that's the only difference here. And then surprisingly, even though now we're considering all this, the time time, the time space and the space space components of the metric, it turns out that this most general solution modulo a gauge transformation within harmonic gauge, which can also be parameterized. Let, let me skip that if you will. They're still only characterized by these two sets of moments, mass multiple moments and current multiple moments. Um, we have first time derivatives of the mass multipoles appearing in this vector potential along with the new contributions from the current multipoles. And the space in the space space part of the metric, nothing new appears, no new information is there. It's second time derivative, well, it, let's say in this form, second time derivatives of mass multipoles and first time derivatives of current multipoles. Although in, again, in general, these spatial derivatives will produce more time derivatives when they act on this thing, if we were to expand this all the way out. But surprisingly, or at least for me, the first time I saw it, it was quite surprising. This is indeed the most general solution, parameterized again, in terms of a very simple set of these tensors, which are functions of a single variable here, the retarded time. Okay. Now, we don't know what these multiple moments are yet. We're just saying, if I want a vacuum solution to the linearized Einstein equation on a flat background, somewhere far outside some source, it has to take this form. And essentially, uh, this is the waveform. This is the final answer for the waveform that we want to get at. At least if we go very, very far away, we go very, very far away from the source. The field is so weak that essentially the linearized approximation is valid. Right? By the time it gets to LIGO, the linearized approximation is very much valid. It will have this form with certain multiple moments. And then the waveform that LIGO is going to measure, if you'll allow me to, uh, of course, I'm writing a metric perturbation. This is gauge dependent, the gauge doesn't, we could use any gauge we want, but anyway, the spatial components, um, in fact, the transverse traceless, we'll come back to this, I think, this time, of the spatial part of the metric, and actually the one over R part of the spatial part of the metric is the waveform that LIGO will measure. So here I picked out the leading terms when L equals two, uh, here there's no spatial derivatives that just directly became this. And so also from now on, these superscripts and parentheses are time derivatives. So this is the second time derivative of this mass quadruple moment. And this, by the way, is exactly the famous Einstein quadruple formula for the waveform except again, we haven't yet said how these multiple moments are related to the source. We'll get there very shortly. And then subsequent terms. So let's say 
just let me point out to pick out this term, this which um, depends on the current quadrupole moment with two indices. Here, um, when L equals two, this is gonna be one spatial derivative. If that spatial derivative hit this one over R, that would give us a one over R squared term, which we don't care about. Like far, far away at infinity, we only care about the surviving one over R terms. That's the waveform. So this spatial derivative has to hit this retarded time and that's where this one over C comes from. And then we end up with not the first time derivative, but the second time derivative of the current quadrupole moment in our asymptotic waveform, the one over R term. Similarly, for the L equals three term from here, there, uh, that, there's one spatial derivative, that spatial derivative has to hit the retarded time that brings down this factor of one over C and this factor of the unit vector pointing away from the source, which came from this derivative hitting that guy up there. So this more or less is the final answer for the waveform that we want that LIGO will measure if we can say now, how are these multiple moments, which so far we're just parametrizing the most general solution to the wave equation outside a source, how are they related to our actual source? And uh, so matching to the near zone. So in all of these expansions that we were looking at here, let me, on the next slide, I'm just going to pick out the mass quadrupole terms and look at what happens with those. So. This, I hope you'll forgive my nested equation style, but this, these are the mass quadrupole terms from the above equations just written out. And, you know, so this, this solution was constructed to be valid in the far zone and going to infinity, but in this matching procedure, we want to take this post Minkowski and multipolar solution and re-expand it in small distances from the system for our matching to the near zone. So what happens when you do that? Well, okay, let's just look at this top term. There was two spatial derivatives. They're just gonna sit outside the whole time acting on the quadruple moment evaluated at the retarded time over R. So to expand that in small R, well, it's just the coming from this retarded time. It's first just that same thing evaluated at T instead of the retarded time. And then a time derivative that brings down, that brings out a factor of R over C and then continuing a second time derivative that brings out a factor of R squared, cancels one of them and then one over C squared, et cetera. So this is the re-expansion of this for small absolute value of X or small R. And similarly for all the other terms. And I've taken this out, okay. Let me first focus on just this guy. And if you think back a couple of slides, in fact, let me just not go back there, but we have now exact, and you know, also if you take into account the translation between H00 and this potential U, but we're going to conclude already here that if this is going to match our post-Newtonian solution, in the near zone, it just tells us, not surprisingly, that this mass multiple moment in our general solution has to be exactly that guy that we derived from the post, the, the mass multi, oh, the mass multiple moment 
that we derive from the post-Newtonian expansion in the near zone. At least at the leading order. And in fact, it even matches, well, okay, note about this term. This term is actually just zero because there are these spatial derivatives outside and this doesn't depend on X anymore. So that term is just zero. This second term actually also matches what we had before from the post-Newtonian expansion. This is this retardation effect that we always kept serving, perturb solving perturbatively in the near zone. Um, that also matches exactly what we had before. With this also being true, um, at least up to order one over C squared. Though possibly these things could start differing at order one over C cubed. And if I, I hope you can imagine or basically see that you will have the same situation. So that, that's one of our main conclusions from this matching so far. I hope you can also imagine or see that J, these current multiple moments, current multiple moments here, they will match our current multiple moments from up here. See, basically to the same order. So that's our first important conclusion and hopefully not too surprising conclusion from this matching. Now, one continues to higher orders. And, you know, so you can see here, I've skipped a couple terms, which I hope you can see what they would look like, but gone up to all the way this fifth order here in these expansions. And let me say all of, okay, briefly consider what if we kind of artificially traded retarded time for advanced time. So basically flipped the sign here. This is, kind of like doing time reversal on the situation. Some of these terms, uh, like for example, this one, all the ones with odd powers of one over C, they would flip sign. So with this one, and so would these guys. So let me use that to argue that these guys are potentially associated with anti-symmetric in time or radiation reaction effects. Whereas all of the other ones, like we saw these guys here were already perfectly matching our time symmetric, if you will, post-Newtonian solution in the near zone, as well as these guys. Well, we didn't really get to this order in the near zone yet, but <clears throat> Essentially, all of the even in time guys are going to match already what we got from the near zone if we went to higher orders in the near zone, which, you know, we already went this high in the near zone, but we could get, for example, this, the four term that's missing here, that would match something we got in the near zone, the three would not. So let me identify uh, something went wrong here, didn't it? Uh, what went wrong here? Yeah, okay, that one is actually not red. That's what went wrong. That one is red, that one is not. That one is red. Okay. So, the even guys are already matching something we had from the near zone. The odd, the red guys are not. 
and you'll have to take my word for this, but I refer you to this wonderfully short and um, explanatory explanation in Misner, Thorne, and Wheeler, the big black book on gravitation, section 36.11. But if you collect all of these red terms that we were just talking about, you will see that there is a gauge transformation which brings them, oh dear, missing parentheses here, into the form where everything goes away, everything is gauge except for something left in what is essentially the Newtonian potential. And you will find that it has this form, you know, not so again, come in from these kinds of terms after a gauge transformation. That is the Burke Thorne radiation reaction potential. And you can also see if we compare this to what we had before, this is like our tidal moment due to radiation reaction. So it ends up in enforcing matching between this <clears throat> post minkowskian solution and the far zone we we're looking at here and this post Newtonian solution, we need to allow for things that in the post Newtonian solution look like a tidal influence from the external universe, but really they're encoding radiation reaction. Okay. Justin, can I ask a quick question? Please, Paolo. Uh, so, I mean, I don't know if you said it, but when you so just about this matching, you yeah. neglected all these one over uh, r squared or one over mod x squared term when you when you just look at the far zone result, right? But then, I mean, why do these not play a role? When Wait, which ones did I? Uh, yeah, so the the bottom line of the slide that we see up. Now there is this plus yes. or there one over x squared, yes. right? Yes. So I, I I can't I don't understand why these terms don't play a role when you try to match to the near zone. They do. Okay. They do. No. So here I was only dropping this to say what is the wave form at infinity. Ah, all right, all right, all right. Here I am not dropping those. Okay, no, okay, so I see, I see, sorry. In fact, so yeah, 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 no, okay. I'm, yeah. This leading term that we were saying is the one that matches. So I know this is hard to see because it's over several slides, but let's say the term, this term, right? Yeah, okay. Which is a one over R cubed. Two derivatives of one over R. Yeah, okay, this yeah, is yeah. One over R cubed term, it's this term which matches uh, this term. But here are the two derivatives. Yeah, so. no, it makes sense. Thanks. Okay. So yeah, I'm definitely not <laughs> dropping these guys uh, in this matching. I was only dropping these uh, to say, what is the waveform at infinity? But yeah, good question. Any other questions so far? So yeah, I didn't give you all the details um, and it relies in the end on this gauge <clears throat> transformation, which uh, would be nice to do things in a more gauge invariant way. But again, in GR, classical GR, it's often just the attitude, pick a gauge that works and do gauge transformations when you have to, but um, that's how we roll. One wonders a lot of the time if there would be a more amplitudesy way of doing everything in a gauge invariant fashion, but it's hard to see how a lot of this would go, uh, but still a worthy thing to think about. Perhaps uh, just, just a small question which yeah. could be related to this. Um, you don't seem to worry about the fact that um, your retarded time, yeah. not an exact null var variable. In other words, you use some 
naive definition of, of retarded time, it looks to me yeah. as if you were in Minkowski space time. Yes. Or in other words, why don't you go to this Bondi, Bondi Sachs quarter? Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, at the level that I was talking about here, like just consider the linearized field equations. So mm -hmm. drop oh. any nonlinear corrections. Our okay. field equation is exactly flat box of h equals zero. Okay. Mm -hmm. To this extent, none of that matters. Okay, good. No, I, I, I got it. Okay, yeah, it's a different expansion. Isn't it? That, is a very, that is a very good question, and it's, it's going to make an appearance, kind of, I think, shortly. But Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you. That's Any it. other questions? And if not, uh, maybe this is a good time. Okay, so... <clears throat> Maybe we'll get started again and first ask for more questions, if there are any. Maybe just a quick question to clarify if I understand correctly, Justin. So the idea is that basically one solves exactly the equation box h equal to zero yeah. relativistically outside the source. Yes. And then we use the small r expansion and the matching to the post-Newtonian analysis, basically to find the boundary condition for this for this uh, equation, right? Yes. So this is uh, okay. Th then one may wonder if, probably related to what Gabriele was also asking, if somehow it's reliable to to keep this linear approximation also. Okay. Uh, but uh, yeah. maybe you come back to this. I don't know. But thanks. Uh, yeah, that that is exactly right. And yes, so this is just the first step. The, the the first step is we think about what happens if we have this. And again, we do, this is true if we are really, really far enough away. Like by the time it gets to LIGO, the, it's satisfying box H, H equals zero. It will be characterized by some moments, which again, will not exactly be the moments that we got from our post-Newtonian source. They, in fact, they start to differ at precisely one over C cubed. That's coming up on the next slide, I think. And that is also indeed related to, uh, in general, of course, this is not exact at where we're doing the matching, right? Where we're doing the matching like let's say on the order of a gravitational wavelength away from the source. Yes, we have to consider H squared terms. And in fact, I, I don't have much more to say about this in that, let me, the, the next point will be, what is the leading order effect of the second, including the second post-Minkowski and field equations in our far zone post-Minkowski and solution, what is the leading order effect of that? And that is this so-called tail term. So uh, here I'm actually explaining what I, not really, but uh, I'm in the most standard form to write the waveform. Um, it would be written in this so-called transverse traceless gauge, which at the level of this waveform that we've been talking about, this, this one over R part that we saw before right here. So this is the same equation, except I've added this TT projector, which essentially is <clears throat> at this level, it's just an algebraic operation, which projects orthogonal to the direction of propagation. This N again is just the unit vector away from the source. Um, and it makes the, this spatial part of the metric satisfy the so-called transverse traceless gauge conditions. So HTT, ij bar 
Um, so it's traceless, of course. And if you dot it into the direction of propagation, you also get zero. So those, these are these, in addition to the harmonic gauge condition, which we're always working with, you can, in linearized theory, further impose these transverse traceless conditions that brings you into the standard form. At this level, it's just an algebraic projection of what we had before. Before we had this second derivative of the mass quadrupole, second derivative of current quadrupole, third time derivative of um, the mass octopole. All of these I should have written are evaluated at this retarded time um, of u of u. And now the difference is this term. The origin of this term, let me, don't at all have time to give any kind of derivation here, but let me just say its origin arises from h squared or 2 p.m. terms in the post-Minkowski and the field equations in the near zone in this far zone, near zone matching procedure. And it is called, so it's called 1.5 PN because of this factor of one over C cubed relative to this leading term. And it's called tail because this is the first term. So everything so far, apart from being propagated with this retarded time outwards from the source, everything has basically been instantaneous, only depending on instantaneous properties of the source. Where here, whereas here we have, so it's determined again by the mass quadruple, four time derivatives, but integrated over the entire past history of the source, this integral detail. So this is not an instantaneous effect, but it's a cumulative effect that must be integrated over the entire past history of this multipole moment characterizing our source. And <clears throat> so I will also just say very briefly that Notice this radiation reaction potential here. Right? We, we said, when we get back into the near zone, <clears throat> we think of this as just now an extra Newtonian potential, which is going to then influence the motion, the enter the equations of motion of our bodies as though it were a, new, a Newtonian potential with this value. But we see it enters at one over C to the fifth or 2.5 PN. If we think about it as entering the equations of motion in the near zone, relative to the leading Newtonian gravity force. <clears throat> and of course, this is this quadrupolar radiation having this effect that corresponds to this quadrupolar radiation that we're seeing here. And then let me just argue by analogy. So this tail is a one over C cubed correction to that quadrupolar radiation. So back up here, it would be one over C to the fifth from this at leading quadrupole times an extra one over C cubed, which gives you one over C to the eighth or four PN when it goes back into the near zone and affects the source. So this radiation reaction due to the tail is the so-called, or one of its effects is the so-called tail term in the four PN even conservative dynamics. Okay, so that was really just an advertisement for what happens when you start 
considering nonlinearities in the far zone, this is the leading order effect. There are many more. This is the only such effect at, let's say, relative 1.5 pn order. Uh, next, at 2.5 pn order, you get a lot more. You get the so-called memory term, which Raphael was mentioning yesterday. At three relative three pn order, you get the tail of tail terms, etc. Um, okay, but having said that, um, let's focus on. So this is a final expression for the waveform as LIGO will measure it. Essentially, or you know, really what LIGO measures is like the Riemann tensor. Um, and I don't quote me on the minus sign, but the time space, time space components of the Riemann tensor are directly in linearized theory are directly related to this um, two time derivatives of the transverse traceless spatial metric perturbation. All right, sorry, I thought of one more thing to mention. So I didn't explain at all here, what is this scale or not, but let me just refer you to, for example, Blanchet's living review. And by the way, Gabriele, this is also very much related to, um, let's say, Bondi issues, uh, which we might hear more about tomorrow. Um, this concerning this tail term and, and what exactly we're supposed to do with this scale, et cetera. But I hope you'll let me gloss over that for now. Uh, but yeah, essentially this is what LIGO is going to measure. And let's just recap. Um, we have an explicit expression for it here up to, let me forget the tail. Let me just say up to relative order one over C squared corrections. We concluded that these i's and j's here are exactly the same up to this tail term as the multiple moments we computed up here. So we had explicit expressions for that mass quadruple moment, including its one over c squared corrections. And then these other two guys, mass octuple, current quadruple, we have explicit expressions for them in terms of the world line. And we have equations of motion for the world lines that come from our Lagrangian. So the waveform, so that you should then see that that's how one could produce a waveform. So for example, take these equations of motion that come from here for the world lines, solve them numerically. And um, so, you know, kind of at leading order, you can even forget radiation reaction. You know, radiation reaction is a plus one over C to the fifth correction here. Although it is an important correction because it's, it's a, it leads to secular changes in the orbit. So in fact, you can also just include that one. So you get some equations of motion from this conservative part, and let's let's say we were only working at Newtonian or zero pn order. Take the Newtonian equations of motion, add this radiation reaction potential. You have then an evolution for your world lines. Your world lines go back into these expressions for the multiple moments. And then you're done. That is the waveform, as we were seeing here. So that's more or less the complete story of how you would produce a waveform at first post Newtonian order. You could even go on to include this tail term and more exciting nonlinear terms that pop up at higher order. Okay, so some last comments are, 
a different way to derive a waveform that's very popular for circular orbits, for example. For circular orbits, you don't have to, you, you can get, uh, you can get all the way to a final waveform fairly easily analytically. Uh, because one, the circular orbit equations of motion are very easy to solve due to the symmetry of it being a circular orbit. You, know, you solve the conservative part for just a circular, enforcing that it be an exact circular orbit for the conservative motion. And in fact, it turns out for circular orbits, it's enough to know the conservative dynamics for the circular orbit, which in fact is just going to be at the end of the day, a relation between the energy of the orbit and the orbital frequency of the orbit. The orbital frequency just being defined the time that it takes to do one circle, uh, two pi over the time that it takes to do one circle. And then you can use a balance argument to derive the waveform. I'm not going to go into exactly how you do this. If the only other thing you knew was the rate at which that orbit is losing energy due to emission of gravitational waves, also as a function of the orbital frequency. There's a way to put these things to two things together called the, in the stationary phase approximation to get, let's say what is often called the Fourier domain phase of the orbit. So that was very sketchy, but ask me later if you want to know more. So that's one example of why it's useful to know, for example, what is the energy, at what rate is energy being radiated away in gravitational waves? And this comes from, again, at least in linearized theory, and at least on average, you know, it's notoriously difficult to localize the stress energy of the gravitational field, but you can do it on average. And um, there are many places. So let, let me mention here one example of a nice review article where you can find this formula and others by Flanagan and Hughes. I mean, there are many places to find this formula, but I find this to be a particularly nice discussion from 05, where uh, at least on average, you can have a stress energy tensor associated with gravitational waves, which is quadratic in the metric perturbation. And it's expressed here in this TT gauge. So we had up here our TT gauge metric perturbation, we can plug it into this formula and then we could get integrated over a sphere at large distance. And we could get flux of, well, actually anything we want, but in particularly for well, energy, linear momentum, angular momentum. But here I'm writing down, if you take this formula, you plug in this field, dropping the tail term, you get this expression for the total energy radiated um, in gravitational waves per time. And so this first part is again, one of the famous Einstein quadruple formulas that it's given by the third time to here, I kind of switched back and forth again between I and M and J and S. They're interchangeable at this order. Oh, that's a typo should be cubed. Uh, third time derivative of the mass quadruple moment squared and by squared, I mean, write that thing down twice contracted on these indices. And that's the leading order. Again, 2.5 PN rate at which energy is lost by the system. And a popular way to produce circular orbit waveform models I was describing here depends only on this and the energy frequency relationship for a circular orbit, which you get from the conservative dynamics. And then these are 
relative first post-Newtonian corrections, which depend on the mass octopole and the current quadrupole. And so here's another example of this point we said earlier that in the post-Newtonian expansion, higher multipoles only enter at higher post-Newtonian orders, which is why it's a good thing to do the multipole expansion in the first place. For example, at Newtonian order, only the mass quadrupole matters. Now, oh, space that I was going to use for something that I don't have time for. <clears throat> Okay, so in the last five or a few minutes, let me, so say we take this formula and in fact, let's just use this leading order part and apply it to a coupler orbit, right? And at this leading order level, right? Only we just need this mass quadruple to zero PN order. So take a Kepler orbit, find its quadruple moment, take its third time derivative, square that, you can get the energy radiated. Let's convert that actually into the total energy radiated per a single period of a bound orbit. And one can get this expression if you do that. <clears throat> now, interestingly, so, so the, all of these terms are, they're all Newtonian order, if you will, or zero PN order. And I forgot to define what is E here. E is the total energy without that rest mass energy contribution divided by mu. So it's roughly like, B squared, this, this guy E. And L is the angular momentum. And this might look familiar to some people in the audience or at least part of it. Um, so, okay, all of these terms are the same Newtonian order but we can see they have different scalings with G. In fact, there's, if you thought about a post-Minkowskian expansion of this quantity, the leading order would be the G cubed, but there are also these G to the fifth and G to the seventh pieces. And this is, for example, this first term, um, is the leading order in, sorry, leading order in the velocity essentially of a recent result from uh, Enrico, Herman, Julio, Parra Martinez, uh, Michel Roof, and Mao Zhang where they did a post-Minkowskian calculation to compute, actually they computed delta E for a, the total energy radiated for a scattering orbit um, at the leading order in the post-Minkowskian expansion and that is at order G cubed. So a third post-Minkowskian contribution. The leading order in velocity of that result is this first term here in the Newtonian result, essentially. You know, it's not exactly Newtonian, but let's say the leading post-Newtonian result. Again, where in the post-Newtonian counting, all three of these terms are of the same order. Now let's contrast that <clears throat> with something that I wanted to talk about last time, but really didn't talk about too much, which was the scattering angle. We mentioned, I think that <clears throat> the scattering angle function, uh, so again, 
think about a scattering orbit. Um, guys come in, they scatter. This is in the center of mass frame, the angle by which both guys scatter as a function of the energy and the angular momentum, say. One can compute this from the Hamiltonian or the Lagrangian. <clears throat> Let's note, what is even the Newtonian answer for the scattering angle? That's what's written down here. Again, this E variable, which is commonly used in post-Newtonian theory, it's essentially like velocity squared. If we think about this in a post, even, even just this literally Newtonian term in a post-Minkowskian expansion, it clearly has all orders in G. But we can also expand in G. And in fact, let's look at, instead of the straightforward Newtonian, post-Newtonian expansion of the scattering angle, a joint post-Newtonian, post-Minkowskian expansion of the scattering angle that looks like this bottom line here. Uh, where we have up to first post-Newtonian order. So dropping the second post-Newtonian corrections, we have, or I've written here, a linear in G term and a G squared term. And I'm dropping G cubed terms, which would be there again, already at Newtonian order. There's gonna be a G cubed term, okay. So it looks like we lose a lot of information about even the Newtonian answer when we do this post-Minkowskian expansion. And it's essentially because you know, in Newtonian gravity, we can have large scattering angles. We can have a 90 degree scattering angle, for example, no problem, even in Newtonian gravity. So whereas post-Minkowskian calculations are really from the beginning, the whole time, assuming small deflection angles. So if we did a post-Minkowskian calculation, we let, for example, to second order in G, we would get only these terms once we re-expanded in velocity. Nonetheless, miraculously, kind of, or um, it turns out that even though there are all these higher orders in G in the scattering angle function, it's joint post-Newtonian, post-Minkowskian expansion exactly up to the level that I've written it here is enough to fix the 1pn Hamiltonian. So just assuming that there exists a Hamiltonian, um, if I ask what is its scattering angle and if it has to match this one, that is going to fix all of the coefficients in that Hamiltonian. And then I could use that Hamiltonian to compute the actual honest Newtonian scattering angle with all orders in G and even these first post-Newtonian corrections with all orders in G. So the final thought ending here is what about for radiation? We saw if we did the leading order post-Minkowskian calculation for example, to find the uh, energy radiated in a scattering, and I didn't mention this, but there's a way to analytically continue that to get the energy radiated in a single period of a bound orbit. So Enrico, Julio, Michael, Mao got this result, analytically continued it to get a result whose first term in the velocity expansion is this one. But that doesn't even recover the entire zero PN level result for this guy. And then my final thought is, well, down here, this expansion 
uh, starting from, <clears throat> we could recover the complete Newtonian and first post-Newtonian conservative parts of the scattering angle or of any, actually the Hamiltonian and therefore the complete conservative dynamics from only a first post-Minkowskian and second post-Minkowskian calculation. Basically, the magic ingredient there in one way of looking at it is assuming the existence of a Hamiltonian that governs all of this. So one is led to wonder, is there something like that which can be done for radiation? Although I have no idea what that might look like and I'm over my time. Uh, thanks for listening and please let me know if there are any questions. Thank you very much, Justin. And thank you very much for this uh, conclusion that gives us a lot of to think of. Is there any questions that people want to ask? Uh, so there's a question. So, yes. Uh, yes. Hello. Hello. So uh, I have a. Can you turn on your video, please? Sorry. Okay. Yes. Okay. So I have already uh, uh, put the question on the Slack. I don't know if you have time to see this. I'm sorry, I haven't. I must have missed it. Uh, Please go ahead. Uh, okay, because it's, it's a more academic question. The question was about uh, what happened if this uh, two body uh, uh, orbit, the velocities is uh, to, to the other limit, let's say if we have an ultra relativistic uh, limit there. And I say that because there are some papers that they have some formulae that depends on this uh, gamma factor at essentially their uh, conclusion is that in that case, the force between the two bodies is becoming very strong. Mm. Is that something which is inside general relativity or is something, you know, what is your comment? So, I mean, we, we also briefly discussed this yesterday in person, right? Like this, uh, okay, in, in the ultra relativistic limit, it's not just, um, if I'm understanding correctly, it's not just that we want, we need this to be small for our approximation to be valid, but it's more like we need that to be small. And, uh, you know, where, B squared over C squared. As V goes to C, this goes to infinity. The gamma factor goes to infinity. So this is going to break down. So can we really say that we have an approximation which is valid for arbitrary velocities like the so-called post-Minkowskian approximation? when as if we really get to ultra relativistic speeds, we're violating something that might need to be true for our approximation to be valid. So our results then really aren't valid to all orders. Let's say for arbitrary velocities. I don't know if you are familiar with these two papers I sent you yesterday. Is one by Blancent Focas and the other is by Focas himself. Okay. So apparently they have this kind of expansion, you know, also which I think is compatible with what you did for small velocities, but they have also the other regime where the V goes to C, and they have some kind of estimate for the gravitational potential in that case. And okay. I'm wondering, is this in general relativity compatible or, I mean, just your comment? I'm not sure I completely understand, but I will certainly have a look at what you sent on Slack and these two papers and 
I'll try to write you an answer on this slide. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. Okay. So, is there any other uh, urgent questions? Okay. So. Then, uh, then we find Justin, and I mean, you can send questions to Slack, and, and then Justin will certainly reply to you later on. I mean, so, thank you again, Justin, for your nice lectures.